I uh, founded the Cibolo Nature Center here uh, 21 years ago uh, on a lark. Had we known what it was going to, you know, avalanche into, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, she's the executive director here uh, for the Nature Center. Uh, the Nature Center has about 12 employees, and uh, we, uh, geez, we have about 5,000 school children a year coming through here on our uh, outdoor classroom program. Um, that means that um, uh, we have teachers, we have volunteers, and we try to give kids hands-on experiences in nature because we feel like the average child growing up in America grows up in an air-conditioned box and hasn't had their feet in a natural body of water, which doesn't make them necessarily informed voters. <laughs> so we, uh, we're, we're hoping to give kids an experience, a personal experience in nature. Um, so uh, the Nature Center started 21 years ago. Uh, we started right away doing land management workshops, helping people how to know how to be good stewards of their property. And not that we knew all the answers, but we sure knew people who were well educated. Um, and so we, we got, hi, come on in. There's a chair right there. Um, and uh, I'm just welcoming, welcoming folks. And um, so uh, the Nature Center, oh, we got some more folks coming in, and we got more chairs over here. Hi, come on in. Hi. Um, I think we have some more chairs in the back we can, we can set you up with. Just you. I'll tell you what I'm going to do for the first few minutes. Uh, this, this, this is a funny uh, building because um, it warms up quick, but it cools off quick. So when you get cold, raise your hand, okay? I'm going to go turn this thing down a little bit. Up to ice water. Uh, there's cookies in the box back there. There's uh, uh, newsletters over there and the brochure about the conservancy. I was uh, wanting to just give you a brief rundown on the history of the uh, Civil Law Conservancy and then uh, launch into what conservation easements are all about. Um, the, uh, the Nature Center, as I was saying, uh, was setting up to do as much education as we could. We brought in, uh, for example, Rupert Stevens the Texas Parks and Wildlife, who has an office behind me over here. And so uh, when you have questions about, for example, anything to do with wildlife or, frankly, land management, Rufus is your state rep that's right here that you can call up and get excellent advice from. Um, also in this building, we have folks that are uh, heading up our research programs. So we're doing research on our native prairie out here to decide uh, what's the best management practices in terms of controlled burns, uh, in terms of simulated grazing, uh, meaning mowing. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, we have folks coming out uh, twice a year doing uh, very intricate species counts. And so they're counting bugs and mice and snakes and you name it uh, so that we can see the direction of changes that are occurring as our little community undergoes more and more development. Um, about 11 years ago, uh, some of the board members at the Nature Center uh, had property. And they're concerned because <laughs> they were saying things like, you know, I love my children, but I don't necessarily trust them. Uh, in other words, uh, what's going to happen to my land once I'm gone? Uh, and what if they get married and divorced and so on and so on and so on? And this piece of land I have is a treasure. It's just something that I would hate to see subdivided and ranchetted and subdivided down to where the magic is lost in this particular piece. My gosh, I've got live water on it, or I've got an old pecan grove, or whatever they have. But the thing is that these folks are saying there's something real special here. And we hate to see it lost. What could we do? And so we started investigating, and we discovered that uh, the Nature Conservancy and the Texas Nature Conservancy, large, well, the Nature Conservancy is the largest land trust in the world, right? And the Texas Nature Conservancy is a big land trust. We started talking to those folks, wonderful people. In fact, we gave, <laughs> eventually gave them an office out here as well. But the deal is, these folks have big goals. They're looking for large tracts of property uh, in their specific targeted areas of interest. And also, it's, it's they're looking for a pretty healthy endowment as well from the property owner. And our folks were just plain old folks, uh, locals. And so we started investigating, uh, are there local land trusts? 
there weren't any real clubs. There, there were, a, were a couple over in Austin. Uh, there was about 30 in Texas. So we started wondering about starting our own land trust. And we did. And that was 11 years ago. Now what the heck is a land trust? <laughs> All right. A land trust is a nonprofit organization. And depending, some land trusts are in the business of, of wanting to, uh, uh, they're, they're well endowed, they've got a lot of money, they want to go out and buy land. Nature Conservancy does this sometimes in, in really threatened and endangered areas. Most local land trusts are not that wealthy. What they're doing though is trying to help landowners preserve their land, keep it in family hands, or if they want to sell it eventually, make sure that when they sell it, it doesn't become fragmented and have huge developments and so on that destroy uh, the, the habitat that is there. Uh, land trusts were established because the, <laughs> there were politicians, frankly, who felt like uh, the government could never buy up enough land to really be a, an effective um, environmental protector. After all, most of the land is in private hands. And frankly, people who own the land are more interested in preservation uh, than most people in the public are. Uh, people who own private land, by and large, are people that are the best stewards of those lands, with some exceptions. So the government started creating tax incentives for people to protect their land forever if that land had particular values, conservation values, or scenic values, or historic values. And we'll go into this in more detail. But the point is, <laughs> land trusts are set up then to partner with a, with, uh, a uh, uh, private family. And the partnership exists because the family says, okay, we would like to put a deed restriction on our property so that it can't be redeveloped. Now you can do this without a land trust. Except that, who's going to see to it that that deed restriction is adhered to once the land is sold, or once you're gone? 50 years from now, 100 years from now, who does that? So the partnership with the land trust is there because the land trust says, we are seeing to it that we're going to be here forever. And so we're the deeds aren't like filed? I thought they were like filed with the county government. They're filed. They're filed. But nobody checks on it. So if your deed restriction says that you can't, uh, um, you can't put a, uh, a shopping center there, all right, and somebody buys it, and puts a shopping center there, who looks at the deed to say, oh, by the way, you can't put a shopping center. I thought a deed was something that kind of went along like a survey. It does, and it's, it sticks with the land forever. But the point is to have somebody that's there that's going to enforce it is a whole different matter. So land trusts actually set up a legal defense fund. And that legal defense fund is there so that in the future, if you have uh, heirs that uh, decide that they want to break that that deed go against one of the conditions of the deed, then you have somebody that's overseeing. Because otherwise, who looks at it? What's sitting like there in a file? Even if it is caught, you go a couple of generations down, grandma and grandpa didn't want us to do this. They're gone. We own it. Judge, would you overrule that? And they overrule it. Yeah. yeah. There has to be some entity that's going to say no. And so... Does it hold up? And Oh yes, oh yes, very much so. Has anybody been able to override it? Um, uh, no, as long as it's been done correctly, no. I mean, they, they hold up. And, uh, but there's uh, this federal and state provisions under a state law right. that protects it right. under what, what Brent's talking about. Now, there have been people that thought that what they could do was throw enough money at lawyers to, to try to break it, and they find out that no, they can't. Right? Okay. So it's a, it's a solid contract. And so, now, and of course, Yes, the land trust has to have some kind of endowment from the property owner that sees to it that you know, the land trust is going to be able to monitor the property once a year. That means they call up and say, hey, sometime in the next couple of months, let's make an appointment so our monitor can come out, look at the property, and go to the, to the site points and, and take a couple of pictures, and then they have it on file that you know, uh, this, this place hasn't been developed. And so that becomes then a way that legally it can be protected forever. Um, and uh, but these don't pe these people don't come on your property without permission, and they come on once a year. 
Um, one of the common misconceptions about conservation easement